Sounds like a plan. So thank you everybody for joining us for this virtual Backpacks to Briefcases. If you're in the Birmingham area, there are storms. Thus, we're changing things up just a little bit, at least the location for Dr. Plaisant. Uh, <laughs> surprised if we might get uh, some lights flickering or, or things like that. Um, hopefully it stays away for the entire presentation, but this new virtual world, you never know. I'm Greg Berry, uh, Assistant Director in the UAB Office of Alumni Affairs. Just another disclaimer, you might see kids, you might see pets. Don't be surprised with all that. I think we're all used to that at this point. Also, in order to be mindful of our guests, please remain muted um, for the presentation. As the unprecedented times we're living in continue, work-life balance does remain a hot topic, but what does it mean in the presence of a pandemic? How can we navigate through it without certain barriers? And how do we get through the pandemic as things continually evolve? Today, we're excited to explore these questions and more with Dr. Eric Plaisance. Dr. Plaisance is the chair of the Department of Human Studies, where he's also an associate professor of exercise physiology. Dr. Plaisance has more than 20 years of experience in the fields of obesity and metabolism. He is also the graduate program director of the Masters in Exercise Physiology and undergraduate honors program director. Dr. Plaisance has a PhD from Auburn University in 2006. Before we bring him in, I'm gonna launch a poll. And we want to know more about our guests. We want to know what your current situation is. And I'll keep the poll up for a few moments so you can submit your answers. Let us know if you're still working from home, splitting your week between home and office, if you've never actually left your office, if you typically work from home, or if you're on summer break or even taking classes online. And I will go ahead and turn things over to Dr. Plassance as I end the polling and we share the results. All right, well, look at that. Still working from home quite a bit. Well, Greg, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I wanna thank you all for being here today. As you can see in the background, I actually had to move to the car to have this conversation with you all tonight. Uh, power's out and that means Wi-Fi is out. So I'm using a hotspot in the car. I, you know, this is one of those work-life balance issues right here in terms of minimizing stress and so, it's kind of ironic that we've gone to this point. So uh, very, very, very interesting uh, times that we're living in nonetheless. So uh, I do want to uh, just start by saying that uh, I'm excited to be here. I appreciate uh, all of you for, for, for being here. And, and so in this presentation tonight, what I'm planning to do, and let's see, Greg, are, are we, is the poll still going? Can we take the poll away? So it, you're good. It's all off. Oh, is it? Okay. I'm going to click that off. Okay. Let's see. I'm trying to move it. There we go. Out of my way. Okay. So what I'm going to do tonight and cover is we're going to look at work-life balance. I want to go through the things, you know, what it is what it, and what it's not, because there are some unique uh, things in terms of thinking about work-life balance, what it means, what it is, what it's not. Um, I want to look at the physical and emotional responses that accompany stress and the stress responses and, and sort of link those two together for you to give you that information so that you can understand physiologically and emotionally in terms of what happens both acutely when you undergo a stressor and then of course in the long-term chronic type of responses. And then I'll spend some time exploring options to help improve work-life balance in, in, in particular in the middle of a pandemic that we're dealing with. And I do want to say before I launch in that my disclaimer is that I am the worst offender of work-life imbalance. And of course, taking advice from me might be the equivalent of asking you fill in the blanks here. So in terms of, you know, where we are in this process, you know, I mean, we're all dealing with this and I have my own issues with regards to, you know, work-life balance. So sometimes you've got to find your own uh, sort of, uh, you know, way in this, but I'm excited to be here. Uh, Mac, if you'll advance the slide, please. So here's the situation. I know that most of you have probably encountered something like this, but you're working from home, 
you're already in a situation where you have a heavy workload and that's probably been increased by more than threefold. In my case, I can tell you somewhere between three and four fold in terms of completing reports, re-entry plans and all the things that we know we have to do to protect our people, you know, but it is, it is added to the workload and, you know, you're living in under one roof with your partner it's 8 30 at night and and this is real life my daughter comes to me and says hey dad i've got homework due it's 8 30 and at midnight it's due and my question is well lauren did you do that homework or did you start no i haven't my first question of course to the teacher is why midnight for an 11 year old uh, and of course she tells me no i haven't done it and of course at work i have a report that's due first thing in the morning I haven't spent any time with my partner and I'm anxious that I have an exercise today. And of course, you know, along those lines, I know I need to eat better, but I've decided instead, you know, I'm going to eat my feelings tonight with Ben and Jerry's ice cream and try to get all this done. So that probably sounds familiar to a lot of you. There's probably a lot of stories that we could all share related to this particular situation. I know that for me, you know, these are daily occurrences in terms of the types of things that I experience. All right, Mac, next slide, please. So this probably looks a little bit familiar to, to some of you in terms of life before COVID. And then um, this actually should be post COVID here in terms of um, what you're looking at. So the pre COVID at the top, if we start there with that, um, when you look across time, this is a familiar type of schedule. So, and for me, prior to COVID, this was my sort of everyday schedule. So get the schools ready, get, get the kids ready um, for school, pack their lunches, all of that, drive them to school. There was a barrier that was in place in the sense that in my personal life, there was this barrier between my work and my personal life in the sense that I had to think about the kids, get them ready for school, get their lunches ready. And then of course, then I'm on my way to work after I drop off the kids and I get in roughly about eight o'clock in the morning. And there's a barrier there as well in the sense that now I'm starting my work day and I can kind of sort of leave the stressors of, oh gosh, waiting in carpool line and all the things that were so stressful prior to that. So there's a barrier now and it feels a little bit like relief, like, okay, I can start my day. And then by the time the stressors of that period from eight to 12 happen, I'm gonna take a lunch break. And as I mentioned to the group this morning, you know, my typical thing to do is to eat at my desk. I usually don't go away, but I'll pick something up that I wanna do. Typically for me, it's not being a, doing administrative type of work. And so I try to do my very best to get into the science that I enjoy or speak with some friends or you know even about science a lot of times and so i try to schedule that time appropriately but there was a barrier and then of course at five o'clock five to six somewhere in that range i would leave the job leave my office again setting up another barrier where then i could go out and think about okay what do i have to do with the family what type of events activities whatever the kids are doing what are we doing and then of course you know, then there's dinner and then there's bedtime and there's all these things to sort of navigate. But regardless of whether you wanted to or not, you had no choice but to take your mind off of work and, and focus that on the family or the kids or what have you. And so when you look at that, that's a pretty typical schedule for many of us. And even if you're in school and you're watching this, this too is at least somewhat familiar to you. But now in the post COVID period um, on this bottom portion that you see in red, of course, there's no barriers. You're looking at a timeline here where let's say it's seven o'clock in the morning where normally you're getting things ready and you, and even before that, maybe at six o'clock, getting yourself ready, getting the kids ready and getting lunch ready perhaps. Well, during that time, you know, that now has shifted. So what you can basically lump into one full course of the day is work, school, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that we know that we have to do. Well, there are no barriers. There's no time frames for those. And so this is, this is what we're learning now in the COVID period that is one of the most problematic things when it comes to maintaining or sustaining this idea of work-life balance. So to say the least, it was difficult before, and now we're finding that in some ways, it's next to impossible 
for some individuals to maintain any barriers. And speaking personally about it, one of the biggest barriers for me is when to start and when to stop. There have been days where I've looked up from the morning at seven o'clock starting to work many times, and it might be nine o'clock at night and I've only taken a break for lunch or whatever, and I've just been working and working and working, especially if there's deadlines and whatnot, because there's no barriers, and I didn't set those barriers. So I want to talk a little bit tonight about that as well. All right, so what is work-life balance? Well, we want to go through what it is and what it's not. And the first thing I want to say is that it is not an equal number of hours of work and personal activities on any given day. So I want you to understand that, you know, it's not four hours of work and four hours of personal activity. That is not what work-life balance is at all. It is not intended to be that way. It will never be that way. In fact, I've had many people, including my mentor, my doctoral mentor say, you know, if you're ever fully in balance in terms of the hours you spend, then you're not doing something right in terms of, because Look, there's deadlines for activities with your family. There's deadlines for things with work. Some things sometimes get out of balance like that. So the key in the next statement is there are going to be day-to-day, month-to-month, and even year-to-year variations, and that's encouraged. It's encouraged for you to evolve within yourself and your personal and your professional life to make sure that you do that appropriately. And so the key here is, And in life, I mean, it couldn't be any more true than tonight. Expect the unexpected and go with it. That's what we're doing right now. I'm in the back seat of the car delivering this. Who would have thought that, you know? And so, you know, but we're making it work. And I know the light in the background is irritating, but otherwise you won't be able to see me in the back of the car. So, but while that's embarrassing, you know, in this world that we live in right now, I mean, expect the unexpected roll with it i mean i i don't know any other way but to do that because if not you know what it's it's just gonna it's either you laugh or you cry about it and i choose to laugh about it and and we've done that tonight already so i am trying to model that a little bit for you as well so i think one of the most important statements in all of this that you're going to hear tonight is really something pretty straightforward and that at its very core it is our basic need in life for achievement and enjoyment. And it's so simple, but isn't it so deceptive? I mean, you know, we all think about these terms, we all throw these words around, but they are two of our most basic needs is achievement. We all know what achievement is. We all want to advance in our careers. We all want to advance in life, in the things that we do. Um, And so from an achievement standpoint, professionally, when I think about what that means, you know, it's different for every one of us. And you can sort of reflect tonight or right now or after, think, okay, what what are the things that I want to achieve professionally and personally? And I think long and hard about those things. And you know, I try in my day to schedule personal things and, you know, because a, a former mentor of mine said, you know, they're not going to put on your gravestone that you were the best professor ever, right? I mean, that's that's not something that I would even aspire to on my headstone. So at the end of the line, what does that look like? What are the things that I wanted to achieve? And I think setting out on those things Uh, is really something that if you haven't done that frequently, that you need to do it frequently. I do that very frequently. I mean, sometimes once a month, sometimes every six months, it depends on what stage I'm in and, you know, in my life. And so achievement's pretty straightforward, but enjoyment, surprisingly, is not as much uh, a straightforward concept as you might think. When most people think of enjoyment, it's sort of the ha-ha moment. What did I do today? How did I, in terms of what made me laugh? What events did that? It's not necessarily that. It's part of it, but it's a bigger thing. It's, and, and I like to say it like this, it's pride. So think about work, enjoyment in, in enjoying your position that you have, um, whether it's a student or being, you know, as an employee or, or what have you how much pride are you able to take in the work that you do? And I, I tell our faculty and staff, um, you know, look, we, we all make mistakes. We all learn from those mistakes. Take pride in the work that you do because it really speaks to who you are. Um, in terms of satisfaction, 
you know, I've oftentimes said with that, with that piece of it, you know, that, that may be the most important part is, you know, with regards to the enjoyment piece and achievement is there's no satisfaction if, the, if you're not able to show some type of achievement that you've accomplished. And as a leader, one of the things I've been trying to do during the COVID period is use the progress tracker that HR recommended so that I can look at my weekly, you know, task that I've done and what did I accomplish? What did I not accomplish that I want to work on next week? And I think evaluating those things is really important. Another part of this, of course, is happiness itself in terms of finding happiness in the people that you work with, happiness in the situation that you have and the way that you set the tone. For me, it's about setting the tone for our faculty and staff. We are only as good as the people in our school. It's not about the buildings, it's about the people. And so that, that happiness and joy needs to be there. We all got into this business in different ways or you're wanting to get into, you know, as a student, if you're a student, you're wanting to get into a certain area. And, you know, you, at the end of the day, what you are planning to do should lead to some level of happiness. Otherwise, why do this? You're going to spend more time working than you are doing just about anything else. So you have to find the joy in that. And one of the things that I always say to people, it, anyone, when they say, oh, it's Monday again. Well, guess what? Monday for me is no different than Friday. I don't view it any differently because you know what? We're going to have a lot of Mondays in our life and I choose not to do that. So Friday's a fun day for me, but so is Monday. And I look at the challenges ahead and try to work towards that celebration. We should celebrate each other. We do in our, in our weekly announcements, I try to celebrate the accomplishments of our faculty, celebrate yourself. It's, there's a difference between being boastful and celebrating your accomplishment and accomplishments and that of your colleagues. You know, my grandfather used to tell me all the time, you know, if you love what you're doing, you've all heard this before, then you'll never work a day in your life. If you love what you're doing, you'll never work a day in your life. It's a pretty powerful statement. We've all heard it many times, but if you really say that out loud, you know, this is what you strive for in a career. And that's one of the big difference differences for me between a career and a job. Someone asked me the other last week at a board meeting, you know, what was your first job? And my first job was working with my dad in his auto mechanic shop. And it's why I'm a professor today because working in South Louisiana in the hot sun, you know, taking out transmissions and, and carburetors back when cars had carburetors when I was a kid, you know, that was not something for me that personally was going to be a career that I could just fall in love with. I loved watching my dad, who was one of the most brilliant people I know, do the work. I just didn't have those skill sets and it wasn't fun for me. And I found something that truly, in, in terms of doing what I'm doing now, that I can say, you know, Monday feels like Friday. And I think that's something that I hope, you know, if you take something away, if your Monday feels like your Friday, then you're probably doing something that you really love to do. Um, also, you know, in terms of, you know, this sense of, of you know, I, I think it's important for you all to understand that that, that part, that sense of being and so forth, these are all parts of the joys of living. And at work, you know, I, want, I would encourage you to avoid the trap. If you're in school, especially, and I can tell you, as I reflect on my postdoctoral fellow training, and I, I trained for six years as a postdoctoral fellow in two different institutions after I got my doctorate. So I probably spent about 18 years of my life in school, um, when I, or, or more actually. Um, and I can remember myself saying, well, when this is all over, I'm going to do X. And when this is over, I'm going to do Z or Y. And, you know, that's a bad trap to get, to get placed into because, as I said to the group earlier, you know, at the end of the day, right now, as an associate professor and department chair, at the end of the month, <laughs> you know, the balance line is about the same as it was when I was a graduate student. And it's close to zero because now I have bigger toys. But at the end of the day, you know, it's pretty darn close. And so, you know, but I had, a, I remember having a whole lot of fun as a graduate student, but then thinking, well, I wish I could do this, or I wish I could do that. And these days I find myself often doing the same thing. 
I wish I could do this. My friends that are not in academia, look at what they're getting to do. Look at the cars that they drive. And you can get yourself caught in a trap. And I, and I do think it's important to not have the, that type of those sense of, of feelings about things. I also want to, you know, in terms of this slide, uh, say that achieving balance is definitely, it's an art, it's not a science. There's no one size fits all for all individuals. We all have different goals and experience experiences. And I would, I would ask you to think about as we go through this, to be thinking about, you know, what, what does that look like for you, all right? So the major consequences that we see with work-life imbalance is really the emotional and physical stress that comes with that. So in the next slide, what I want to show you is some of the acute responses to a stressful event. So as part of the idea of work-life balance, again, I want to remind you that these very short-term responses ultimately over time are going to build on each other and lead to what we're going to see in the next slide, which is an, the, the chronic responses. Mac, we'll go back. I'm sorry. I gave you the, the pre-advance too soon. So one of the things that I told the group this morning on this slide that I wanted to do was I wanted to go in a little bit more detail tonight since I have some, some extra time to go through. Um, but I wanted to share with you what happens in an acute stressor. So for example, and I thought this was hilarious in the picture below, you know, this is a type of fight or flight response, right? So if you're out in the jungle and a tiger's chasing you, right? All the things I'm about to go through, they're going to happen. And I just think this is hilarious. You know, the kid on the bike running away from the, the dad or whatever on a, with a tiger on his back. It's hilarious. But that said, um, you know, this is the type of thing. You know, you're running away from this or that. You, or, you know, I've got to give a presentation and I don't like giving presentations. I love giving presentations, but I know that's a response a lot of people give is, oh, my gosh. That armpit sweat in my brain. And you can hear it in my voice. I mean, when I have undergraduate students, and those of you that are undergrads on there, believe me, I'm right there with you. Remember, as an undergrad or graduate student, just going, oh, my gosh, you want me to speak in front of people? What? No, I don't want to do it. And I remember that feeling of sweating, and, and you could hear it in my voice. And, you know, it, with time, that goes away. And obviously, you get to a point where you get comfortable and I will tell you that I still always get very nervous, and I think that's a good thing because it means you care. So just know that that's another part. Uh, and I'm off the beaten path a little bit, but going back to the acute responses, you know, what happens right away, and this allows us to, you know, if, we, if there's a car that's coming right at us and we dodge out of the way or someone says something to you that gets you upset, these responses occur, and, and it's to help us you know, fight or, or fly away. And so the idea is blood sugar will rise. Your insulin levels rise because what's happening is we're trying to provide the energy that we need for you to get out of that acute response. You also get fat release from fat cells, which sounds like a good thing, right? If you're overweight or trying to lose weight, that sounds like a good thing. And acutely that can be. But one of the big problems that we see in an acute response is that heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up and breathing all increase. And so, and you can think about all of those things when you're under a stressful event. I mean, if you follow your favorite football team out there, right, and we're watching the Blazers and we're watching football and it's the fourth quarter and there's five seconds left on the clock, are they going to score the touchdown or not, right? And you're just waiting on pins and needles to see what happens. If you really measured your heart rate and your blood pressure and your breathing increased, think about all of the, I mean, these events are real. You know, during football season, the ER, even at UAB, sees the highest rates of heart attacks during that period of time, during stressful football games. So it's a real thing. Your pupils will dilate so that you, of course, have better vision to get out of the situation that you're in. And then blood flow gets distributed away or uh, from core tissues to active tissues like muscle, again, so that you have that flight type of response to get out of a situation. So this is acute and we're meant to do that. But the long-term responses is where really we interact and create this intersection between work-life balance because it's the day-to-day -day acute stressors that we have from either work-life imbalance, stressful events during our workday, 
And in that chronic environment within your brain, what we see is that there's an activation peripherally in what we call your adrenal cortex, and it releases a number of hormones, one of them being cortisol. And you've probably seen some things in the, in the popular literature about the, the perils of high levels of cortisol, because what that will do is lead to all of the bullet points that I have here, which is, for one, to increase circulating amino acids. Where, where, where do amino acids come from? From proteins. And proteins come from, from your muscle. And that's not necessarily a good thing as we age, because the more muscle we lose as we age, the more fragile we become, and the less independent we become as we age. And so in an aging work, you know, population, especially, you know, we're seeing baby boomers continuing to work into their late 70s and 80s now and not retiring in some cases. And so, you know, we're seeing this situation where, you know, people are working longer and, you know, the question will become, so we all want to work as long as we can. And one of the deciding factors for you individually and whether you can do that is your physical ability to do so. And so while this may not seem like a big deal, but chronic stress will enhance or accelerate your protein loss, meaning you're going to lose muscle, active muscle. Um, we get increased formation, though, of glucose or blood sugar from the breakdown of both proteins and fats, which is really interesting because another big problem that happens is that causes a release of insulin from your pancreas. And those three things right there that I just described in those first bullet points ultimately increase your risk of metabolic diseases like diabetes, for example. So it's one of the number one reasons that we see long-term stress playing a role in leading to metabolic disease like diabetes. The other thing it can do as well is increase inflammation. And the inflammatory response that we get within our vasculature can lead to increased heart attacks, increased uh, you know, metabolic disease and diabetes again as well. So big problems with inflammation. And then during this time in a, in a viral pandemic, you know, decreased immune function is really not a place that we want to be. And in fact, individuals that have decreased immune function are really at the highest risk at this point. And if you've probably seen the, the popular press right now, you know, individuals that are overweight or obese who have diabetes, who have high blood pressure, are all at increased risk right now of not necessarily uh, contracting COVID, but having some of the more severe responses to COVID-19. And then, of course, your sleep patterns can change, as we all know. That's very practical and applied. We all know that. But part of the reason for that is chronic stress decreases your serum serotonin levels, which ultimately um, actually reduces your ability to sleep and to get into a deep REM sleep where we get the most rest. All right, next slide. So this is an acute stress response that we see. This is salivary cortisol levels that you see on the left on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you see time. And what they did in this particular study was that they used a stressful condition like a job interview uh, in the first part, and that's what the TSST is. And then in the second part of it, they did a GRE type of test, so like an ACT or GRE type of test. And ultimately, the take home here is pretty straightforward, that even acutely, you can see that cortisol levels in the stress condition in the black closed circles, that's the stress condition. Look at the difference in cortisol levels beginning just 15 minutes in to that job interview. How interesting is that? And we've all been through job interviews in some sort. And, you know, you'd be lying to yourself if you didn't get a little stressed out about it. And so, of course, this is a cortisol response that we see here. And even with the mental challenge that we've seen, you know, this is interesting that cortisol levels are still relatively high, much lower than during the interview portion. But during the stressful thinking period as well with the GRE type of test, they still have cortisol levels at 55 minutes in that are higher than what we see in the control group that did not have that condition. So it's really interesting in terms of what's happening there. And of course, the practical application of this is, you know, what can we do to try to relieve some of those stressors and the responses that we see? And we'll talk a little bit about that. All right. So in terms of work-life balance in a pandemic, this is really the core of what we need to talk about tonight in the sense that, you know, what are some of the things that you can do to help this situation? And so one of them 
is to establish boundaries for work and for leisure time. So for example, I showed you in one of the opening slides that going from pre-COVID to post-COVID, we had a situation where in the pre, we had all these barriers. It might be in my case, taking the kids to school, then going to work, a lunch break, and then work, you know, ending, going home and so forth. Well, these days it all runs together. I mean, I see a lot of living rooms in the background, which means, you know, normally we'd be home anyway. Um, but that said, what it looks like during the day as well on many of my Zoom calls. And so we have no boundaries, first of all, between our workspace and our home space. And if you have children like I do, you know, as, as Greg said up front, you may see kids running in the background. You're gonna see things like this all day long in your day-to-day -day life right now. And that's to be expected. And so in terms of the boundaries, the things that you have to do, and this is my recommendation to you all, is that what I try to do in the morning and, and to model what I'm about to tell you is, I still wake up at the same time. I try to get up at 5.30 or six and I take a shower, eat breakfast and you know get ready for work and then I start working and typically these days I've been working at seven I've changed my format up a little bit I used to work out first thing in the morning go to the campus rec and work out there take a shower and get to work by eight well now because that's not open and I don't have access to a shower away from home I go ahead and I what I've been doing is either doing it first thing in the morning or taking a lunch break and then sometimes going into the office, but still mostly working from home. But I try also to get out a little bit, create a barrier with exercise where I might do 20 to 30 minutes of walking in the morning. I'll take Zoom calls. I will take, uh, as you can see, I, you know, I'm pretty adept at kind of changing things up a little bit. So having a Zoom call while I'm walking or in turning off the video um, and still being able to get the information. Now, if I'm leading it, I won't do that, but if I'm on a call getting information from anyone, I'll oftentimes turn the video off and just listen and walk. Um, and if you think about that, you know, what better time than now to be able to do that? Turn your video off and go for a walk. I mean, and that's a great way to break things up. You still get the information. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, these are high level type of things. This is not where you're talking budget for the next school year. I mean, this is, you know, other types of information. Oftentimes I'll have faculty that'll call me and say, hey, I'd like to talk about this or that. And I'll say, okay, and I can hear them walking and I'm walking too. So it's a, it's a neat thing to be able to do that the, this time uh, in terms of what's going on. So making sure that you set those boundaries. Also thinking about after work calls, and how many times have any of you had, you know, it's nine o'clock at night. Hey, can you take a call right now? And I'm going, mm, I want to set that boundary as much as I can. So still that five o'clock sort of, let's not call each other past five. Let's try to not call on the weekends if we can. Be because otherwise you, you basically cloud those boundaries. In terms of prioritizing, one of the things that I would recommend that you do if you have not already is especially right now in a pandemic and being isolated the way we are. Think about your top five priorities. I mean, we all have just a little bit more time these days to think than what we did before because there's less hustle and bustle. And so I, I've tried to do that in my own. And, and the things that I, for me, is one of the things that I wrote down here just to give you an idea is maintaining meaningful personal and professional relationships as my number one because right now being isolated and just being around the kids and, and you know and family wise I mean we're under the same roof I mean 66 you know days or in however many days we are now that, that was you know probably a few weeks ago so we've been under you know these circumstances now for a while and so but one of the most important things for me is making sure that even away from the building how am i maintaining the relationships with our faculty with my colleagues within uab and outside of uab um, thinking about my own personal physical and emotional health and wellness Look, you can only be as good as your physical and emotional health and wellness. If you're not taking care of yourself, how can you take care of anyone else? We've all heard that before, right? But it is so true. We cannot be good for others if we're not okay. So take care of yourself. Also think about my own professional growth. 
there's a lot of things that I can't do right now as a scientist as far as being in the lab and doing things I would like to do with my students and my postdocs and so forth. But nonetheless, we're writing more than we have. We're thinking more together. We're writing grants. We just submitted a big grant to the NIH. And I probably wouldn't have had time had it not been for COVID, but we did that and we took advantage of it. I've been pursuing hobbies a whole lot more too and observing the world a lot more as well, going fishing, taking my son fishing and my daughter fishing. And I mean, pursue those things and make sure you prioritize those things in your life. And then the other thing I've personally been really interested in is developing a consulting business. Um, I'm really into the whole diet and exercise landscape right now. And there's some really cool things I'm thinking about with some former students. And I'm really trying to develop that business on the side as sort of a, as the students say in my classes, a little side hustle, so to speak. So trying to do that as well. Um, so calendaring is important as well when you think about strategies that you can use in a pandemic. So the most important thing here is one of the first things you can do, and I love the idea about HR to uh, track in this progress tracker that some of you are probably familiar with if you work at the university, is to use your calendar to keep track of how you're using your time. What accomplishments, I mentioned that at the top, what did you accomplish this week? What things you know, do you wanna work on for next week? And I think that sets some priorities in place as far as your professional workspace. The other thing to keep in mind is that you can eliminate what you can't. So there are some things that I know in my own career that I go, why, you know, why am I taking this much time to do this particular thing? Can I eliminate that? Can I get off of this committee? Do I really need to be on that committee? Or is that something that I can have someone else do? So that brings us to delegation, right? And I, and I, and I think that a lot of times, it's not about having someone else do that. That sounds insensitive, but is it something that will help you to be better at what you do? And of course, you're always thinking about how that might help someone else as well. I love this image that you see here uh, from the book, The Last Lecture. It's one of my favorite books. It's published by Randy Posh just before he died of pancreatic cancer in 2008. And Dr. Posh wrote this book and he went on a tour. You may remember it. He was on Oprah Winfrey back during those days in 2007, 2008. Um, not long after this picture, he, he died. And, um, and what I love about this is the idea of delegation that he talked so much about in his book, which is that you see in the picture on the left, he's holding the bottle for his daughter while she's eating. The flip side of that is on the right. <laughs> it's interesting. She's now holding the bottle. So even at that young age, he's able to demonstrate you know, this idea of delegation. And he talks a lot about that in his book. This is a man that had just a few months to live and decided, you know what, I want to write a book about delegation and about, like it was all about his life and the things he's learned in his life, which is, if you've ever heard of a last lecture, that's what a whole, a last lecture actually is. And ironically, um, he was asked to give a last lecture and it truly was his last lecture. But I love this image because it does show that, you know, there's so many things we need to evaluate in our workspace that, you know, what things can we delegate so that we can do the things that we really need to do to move things forward in our own unit. So create, uh, oh, the last one, if we go back, Mac, I'm sorry. Uh, Mac's ready for me to get to that next slide. So, uh, Create time to think, you know, because I do, and I want to give you all time for questions, so we do need to get through this. But check and respond to email no more than three times a day. Anybody heard that before? I mean, that's one of the classic leadership skills that when I, in my leadership training that I've always gotten. Don't just go at a whim with emails because it really zaps your creativity. It zaps your productivity. I try to do that no more than three times a day, and I will tell you with you know, texting and with, you know, this sort of, you know, right now type of culture that we live in, that sometimes goes at odds uh, in some situations. And if it's, uh, you know, important and I've got to respond, I'll do that. But I try as much as I can. All right, next slide, Matt. So as we kind of wrap things up, you know, some other strategies to improve your work-life balance in a pandemic is to, and, and this is near and dear to me as an exercise physiologist, 
is your personal health and wellness. Because you know what? I think about my career at UAB and I'd love to be around for 35, 40 years working because I have no interest in retiring. I have some hobbies. I love my hobbies. But in terms of doing what I do for a living, uh, there's no point in retiring for me in terms of if I can still do what I do when I'm 80 or 85 years old, I'd like to do it because you know what? We've got a pretty great gig in terms of what I do and, and I'd like to be able to continue to do that. Take off a little bit more than what I normally do now, but I will tell you, um, you know, working for me, I find a lot of joy in that, but I also know that there are a lot of things that I have to think about in order to be able to do that. And so do you. So developing or maintaining sleep patterns is probably one of the most important things for you. And if you want to ask the question, what's the ideal number of hours of sleep? Guess what? That's an art too. There is no science for that. Um, what we know is that it's independent on, or it's dependent rather on the individual. So for one person, it might be four hours. For another, it might be eight, might be 10 hours. It's just like the consumption of water. I get that misconcept all the time. Shouldn't I drink eight, ounce, eight, eight ounces of water every day? The answer to that is absolutely no. Your body will tell you when you're thirsty and you will drink the amount of water that you need to drink on your day-to-day -day basis. Your body is built to do that. So all of these types of misconceptions are important for you to understand and that's a different conversation, of course, than tonight. But sleep, if you want true balance in your life, that's going to be a big one. So another thing to think about is your dietary quality and quantity. I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, there's, you know, with COVID, I can tell you that I have gained some weight because, you know, I haven't been able to go to the campus rec and lift. And the intensity of my exercise is far less because I can go for a walk or a jog and do push-ups and sit-ups. That's far different than getting in the gym and actually lifting and doing bench presses and squats and things like that that burn a whole lot more calories and activate muscle in different ways than what I'm able to do now. Uh, I mentioned to you already at the top, you know, about walking during Zoom meetings or taking phone calls. I can't tell you how many times I've gone, I should have been walking over the last hour that I've been on the phone with someone where we were having a relatively light discussion, work-related but nothing that I could, I, I didn't need to write anything down. It was just working through an issue with a faculty member or staff member. And I could have been walking that whole time. Another thing is to recharge your batteries. Take a staycation, as they say sometimes, which we've all had to do, of course. Um, but, you know, I've organized more closets over these last few months, you know, just kind of taking a break in the day and doing something different. Um, I've learned to really enjoy washing the dishes, as crazy as that sounds, just to to break up the monotony of the day and thinking take on a home project if that's you know if, if you're like me I like to be outside and it makes me feel like I have a real job because my job getting to work in the air condition and do what I do doesn't always feel like a job for me uh, and that's again that's a nice place to be and do yourself a favor put your cell phone down sometimes put your laptop down and ipad and you know what the best advice i can give you and this i can i learned the hard way as a department chair in my first couple of weeks doing this is the amount of listening and really hearing people right it's one thing to listen it's another thing to hear them but it is a skill set that you have to develop and i can tell you early on for me that was a challenge you know hearing about different issues having to take complaints and so forth. Truly listening and hearing is one of the most valuable skill sets that you can develop these days. Um, you know, and then, you know, create, create new things, create a side gig, as I mentioned, you know, keep yourself motivated. So um, I guess, I think that's it, Mac, on the slide. So with the time we have left, um, I would love to answer any questions that you all have. And again, I want to thank you for your patience with the light in the background and me sitting in the back of the car to do this. So. Thank you so much. Great information. Um, we do have a couple of questions right now in the chat box. So if anybody else has some, go ahead and, and start putting those in there. Um, Cindy says she gets emails in the middle of other tasks and feel like she just has to pounce on them. She has to answer them right away before she forgets. Um, are there tips on organizing work when there are so many distractions? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I will tell you, I deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis. What I typically do, to be honest with you, is I turn off my email so that I just close it out so that I don't see those pop-ups 
in my right corner because that is distracting. So my first advice is what I do is I, I generally will turn it off. Um, and I am bad about sometimes opening it up just to make sure that I don't have any terribly important things. But here's the thing that I've, I've found is that if it's really important, someone's going to call me or they're going to text me. And then that's when I really know that I've got to get on that. So that's one of the ways to reduce that distraction. The other thing too is to put your phone away because I can tell you I'm the worst offender of that. If I have my phone in my hand while I'm working, what I find myself doing is working through a difficult problem or a challenge and then going, oh, well, let me see what's happening right now on Facebook or something like that, right? I mean, I'm guilty of that. You know, it happens because I'm going, okay, I want to skirt the issue I've really got to deal with. So I'm going to sidetrack myself with this. So I try to keep my phone away as well. And then what I also do too, is I set boundaries of time that I'm Cindy, that's the question. So, you know, this morning I had to read a manuscript for a colleague to get that out. And I had a bunch of other things to do um, that I wanted to get done. But I will tell you, I blocked out two hours to really give it a good read and do that and didn't let any other distractions get in the way, no matter what they were. And I think it's really critical that you block that out in terms of those times. Today, I'm going to work on this during this period of time. I'm going to do this. And there are going to be circumstances where you're going to have to break that up and, you know, I'll have our dean contact me and say, hey, I need to speak to you now. Well, I've got to take that call. Faculty, I've got to take that call. But most of the time, I try to defend that as much as I can. I think you can expand that from emails to all of the other communications, teams and all of that as well. I agree, 100%. Text messages, all of it, yes. Um, somebody else mentions uh, or is asking, where can they find the UAB progress chart? I use over the, the progress tracker? So my understanding is that HR generated the progress tracker. Um, I think that uh, Greg, you and Mac have my email, so feel free as well. Um, you know, for, for the questioner, uh, I'm happy to send that to them uh, via email. But I'm almost, I'm pretty confident that it's it's on the HR website. Um, but it's a pretty straightforward document. You know, it's and it's intended to go. You know. From basically direct report so my dean as as the direct report to her I, I generate this document on a weekly basis and then the idea is that we then talk about those things that challenges accomplishments and how those things went so yeah I'm happy to to get that for the the questioner about that um, yeah so a lot of people find it hard to delegate and you touched on that what do you say to the person that it is a challenge for me. Myself is one of them. I, it is just, I want to do it myself and it, it's hard to let go. Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the things that we all deal with is in your mind, okay, I can do this better than anyone else. Greg, have you ever said that? You know, like in, the, in, in a humble kind of way, like I feel like I can do this better than if I hand this off, like I need to be the one to do that. And there are some situations where that may indeed be the case. But the, one of the issues that I have found, and, and I learned this, honestly, the, I learned this the best when I actually, as a mentor to graduate students, because what I was finding myself doing was, and, and I learned this skill set because it, let's say it was benchtop skills that they had to do. Well, I knew the technique, but one of the things that I found myself doing was, well, I can do this better than they can do it and I can do it quicker and not take the time to train them to do it. And then what I found myself doing was, okay, now they don't know how to do it and they're relying on me. So I, I, so I learned that skill set a long time ago with graduate students. And the key on that is in terms of, if you're like me and you know, like a lot of people, I'm a perfectionist when it comes to the end product. And the thing that I try to do along the way is I do touch points with the individuals that I delegate, delegate to. And you know, what I have found more often than not, Greg, is that, and this is what's been great for me, is it may not be exactly the way that I wanted it necessarily done, or it may, I may have done it a little bit differently. The fact of the matter is, is every individual that you work with that you might delegate something to is going to have a different take on it than what you had. So what I'm finding is that oftentimes 
and this has really helped me to delegate is, wow, I didn't even think about that. And they're bringing this to my attention and it's made the product that I thought we were going to get even better than what I had before. And that's the beauty of it. And so when you get that type of positive reinforcement over and over and over again, that happens. The other advice that I have as well is to know your people and to know who you're working with, right, on your team. I know that I can delegate certain things to this individual while I can delegate certain things to other individuals. That's where the listening and the hearing and the understanding, um, knowing who you work with, I mean, that's a skill set that I think is the most important before you can really be good at delegating. It's knowing the ins and outs of what drive people, right? I mean, I, I can't tell you how often um, I've had people tell me, you know, before becoming chair, well, this person, you know, is difficult to work with, or this person is great to work with or whatnot. First thing I do is say, you know what, I'm going to judge for myself first, right, in terms of who does what or how I do this or how they work with me or whatever. And what I have found, what's interesting is, you know, some of the people that you go, okay, this person may be difficult to work with. Well, the problem was, you know, maybe they didn't have a voice. Maybe they were trying to figure something out, right, in terms of what their, what their strengths were. And their, so help people find their strengths. And when you do that, it makes it a whole lot easier to delegate and it makes it a whole lot easier for them to find value in working with you as well. So, you know, I know that's kind of all over the place, but those are just some of the tricks that I've used to help myself in that way. Another, uh, another thing in the chat box, if this, summer, uh, if this summer of COVID, you know, the amount you of work usually goes down um, throughout the summer. And that is typically the case. So how does one balance the lower workload and not stress over not doing enough during? Yeah, I think that's, that's a really important question. And I think it depends on your position within the system, right? I mean, you know, it, because in a lot of ways, I, one of our office assistants said a lot of times she's in a position where she'll email me. Um, and can you all hear me now? Okay. Um, so where she'll email me and say, Hey, is there anything that I can do for you right now? Or we'll get on a zoom or she'll text me and say something like that. And I'm, she's finding it very difficult at times where she's going, Hey, can, can you, I do this or that. And even with scheduling, for example, she normally handles my calendar. And I mean, right now it's, there's been less of a need for her to even do that. On the other hand, though, what I'm finding from our faculty is that it's the complete opposite, is that they're actually busier than what they were before and finding it difficult for them to think about, you know, other projects that they have because they're finding so much time and need, needed time with new, you know, software platforms for teaching and so forth. So there's a lot of new that's coming from that on a big learning curve that they've had to undergo. And they too are spending three and four times longer than what they would have in the classroom than you know, what they were before. So, I mean, all of that to say that, you know, you, you, in terms of the lower workload in the summer, I think it's a time to think about within your position, you know, what are some of the things that you all as a group have been putting off you know, in terms of big ticket item projects that you would want to work on. So if you're in a position where, you know, you're in leadership, you have to think about it one way. And if you're in a position where you might say to your, to the person that you work for, you know, Hey, we've been thinking about this as a, as a possibility, this particular big ticket item project. Hey, now's a good time. Let's, let's work on that. Would you support me taking the lead and doing something like this? So I think that's where it's really important to have conversations with each other. And I encourage our faculty and our staff anytime to contact me and say, because we have it happen a lot. Hey, I was thinking about doing this. Uh, for example, one of our faculty in counseling, they were trying to figure out how do we get um, mail um, to get written informed consent to see clients in our counseling clinic? How do we get that? You know, and we, we couldn't get an electronic signature. We had trouble with that. We thought about doing it with U.S. mail. Uh, too slow to be able to get, get it in time. 
So we're basically doing, you know, a, a drive through informed consent drop off, basically where they drive up. We, and I would have never thought about that, but one of our students who we brought in actually had that idea and said, Hey, you know, not that I got a margarita from little donkey, but I did. And, uh, it was a drive through type of thing. They gave me my margarita and I went on my way and as a graduate student, of course. Um, and I thought, you know, that's a great idea. We should enact that for our workspace. And, and we all were thinking about that. And so that's a little ticket item, but that's an example. But the big ticket items, you know, working on things that we may not have, we've put off with the strategic plan or whatever it might be. So just within your own unit, be thinking about the things, hey, we put this off. I'd like to work on this. So, yep. You talk about setting up boundaries, and I think this might be the last question that we have. Sure. Articulate those boundaries to your coworkers so they know, I'm only checking emails three times a day. That's right. So I can tell you that I articulate that to our faculty and staff. You know, I, each semester, you know, I try to remind the faculty and staff of those boundaries that we are in a two-way street on that and that I want to respect that time for them. And I ask, of course, for them to do that as well, unless it's terribly pressing. And I definitely don't want to come off sounding insensitive, but at the same time, unless it's pressing, let's, let's observe that for each other. So it is important that you communicate that. So it's a wonderful question. And the answer to that is, the most important thing when you're setting boundaries like that is to be extremely communicative with your with your team. Um, if you are a teacher or if you're in the classroom, um, one of the most important things there as well is to communicate that to the students in the classroom as well because that's where things oftentimes can get troublesome because I've, I'll give you a good example where, you know, I might be giving a test in the morning and then at 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock at night, I'll get the question, hey, can you explain this for the test in the morning? And at 11 o'clock at night, you know, I'm, while I, you know, I understand that students are paying a lot of money for the class and I value that and I will usually answer because I do, I, I will tell you that my philosophy um, as, as an employee of UAB is that our students pay a lot of money to take courses and I will give them everything I have. But I think it's important to communicate to the students and I think it's important for the students to communicate back with us. You know, what are our expectations about that? And, and I do tell my students that, look, you know, I think we can all agree that, you know, after hours, you know, the night before a test, that that's tough with my family to then come back and do that. That's a lot to ask. The flip side of that again is I do don't, don't want to sound insensitive because that's important to respond as well in a timely fashion. But I think we can all agree that you have to communicate those boundaries to whoever's, whoever you're in front of, they have to know that because if you do that up front, then it takes away a lot of the, you know, potential frustrations that you might have with the people you're working with. So Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. A wealth of information. Tremendous job. Thank you uh, so much for the in entire audience, Dr. Eric Lassans, for taking time to be with us tonight. Well, thank you all for being here. I, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Mac, for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. Greg, thank you. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you so much. A recording of tonight's webinar will be available online tomorrow. And be sure to watch for upcoming backpacks to briefcases. In July, we'll host sessions on developing your personal brand and how to become financially secure. You'll be able to find them at alumni.uab.edu. And don't forget to check out our conversations with alumni as part of UAB Green and Told, our podcast. It's dedicated to sharing the stories of you guys, the UAB community. New episodes of Green and Told are released every other week. The latest one was yesterday. You can find us on Spotify and iTunes, as well as alumni.uab.edu slash green and told. And you can interact with us all hours of the day, maybe three times a day on social media. Uh, I'm just taking a note from Dr. Plasance. Uh, we can be found at UAB Alumni on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can look us up on LinkedIn and just search UAB Alumni Community. And finally, if you want more information about us at the National Alumni Society, visit our website, alumni.uab.edu, or email alumni at uab.edu. Once again, thank you all for joining us for tonight's Ask the Briefcases. Good night. We hope to see you soon. And as always, 
Go Blazers.